Thinking about it now and watching this intro again for the second time, such a great touch having the father instill in Thorfinn a respect for human life with the person who showed up in their village, contrasted amidst all the, the carnage. Oh yeah, and I realized that that was not an apple core. I don't know why I thought that. It, it was a mushroom. The intro is really raw. I liked it a lot better, a lot better the second time, for sure. It means more to me now. Fish. Northumbria, Northern England Viking site. Just Saturday bath time with the bros. Oh no, did they interrupt bath time? Whoa. Ooh, it, ooh, in their most raw and naked moment. Oof. Ah, this, there's something so extra. But bath time. You better train real good, kids. The English don't like you. Okay, Mikasa. Is this just like them playing on their own, their own initiative, or is this training? They're just having fun. These kids just gotta lay in the snow for a while. Playing at death. He respects the game. Oh, there's something so sweet about that. <laughs> Leif Erikson seems like a, a gentle spirit. He's like a good guy. Oh, it's a booze run. Respect. Right. It's for religion. <laughs> That's why I came. <laughs> why else would I be in this godforsaken place? Ooh, just out of the blue like that, all of a sudden. I think we saw that coming, right, in the, in the first episode. There was a certain blonde character. Well, they're all blonde, but... Is there anything that this man cannot do? Oh. Everything is changing. Everything is about to change. Okay, but... Okay, but they're not... They're not attacking. We can talk it out first. Thor's is a diplomat first. This looks more like an army and a unit. No one's stepping out and getting chained. If they were going to attack, they would have done it when you had bath time. That seems to be the way of the land around here. We got some history. I feel like this might turn friendly. I think this might turn friendly. Ooh, the, ooh, the respect. Was this the guy that we saw in the first scene? Were they fighting side by side? I can't remember. Floki! Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the, the oaf or whatever. Doesn't look very oafish. Oh, maybe this is Ned Stark. Maybe this is a request. Come fight my war for me. You could have sent a letter or like a bird or whatever you guys do. He doesn't need to. I mean, he's such a glorious man, I can barely even comprehend, but just on my own little non-warrior micro scale, I think in general when it comes to pursuits, especially those of the, the material or hedonistic varieties, people will look at those things and assume that it's a way of receiving value. And partly that comes from the fact that certain things will get you a lot of attention because they're so desired by others who are, are playing a similar game. And I know that when I've been in that state when there's something I really wanted or thought would make me feel like I had, you know, accomplished something, I would take even the smallest things and blow them up for self-aggrandizement or attention or whatever the case may be. And it's kind of soul crushing because you know deep down that it's it's really nothing. You know you haven't made it to the level you want to you make it to yet. You know you're kind of scrounging for, for scraps. Then a weird thing happens when if you actually end up reaching a certain level where people actually would be envious or you actually get what you need out of something. One, there's kind of a humbling that comes from that because you might realize how, how deep something actually is and how much of it was perhaps based on luck. Secondly, with certain things, you start to get a sense of what a trap it is and how empty that whole game was from the beginning. It's sort of stacked against you. And in some areas, it might be a point of shame even thinking that you've compromised other things in order to get this thing that turned out to be a very little value in the, the grand scheme of things. You know, it's not to say you can't take any utility out of your accomplishments, but there ceases to be any utility to be found in that kind of self-aggrandizement. And we actually get both perspectives simultaneously because we have Thors who just, he's not going to be the one to brag about his exports, even though he's actually an S-tier warrior and knows the world. And you have the village people and you have Thorfinn who just think being a warrior is the greatest thing you could possibly be. They all crave power probably because of the lack of it they feel in their own lives. But to have it is to reveal that there's a lot bigger, deeper games to be played. Thors is probably not going to be complimented by this. He's probably going to be upset by this just because he wants to distance himself from this life as much as possible. It's probably a point of great pain for him to reflect on. But another thing about that is you can't give that knowledge to someone. They have to go on that journey on their own. And in fact, I think actually, while the destination itself might not be anything of value, the journey is, you know, it's cliche for a reason. All accomplishment, if it's true accomplishment on your part, reveals some kind of truth, even if it's a truth that you don't expect or want. 
Right, yeah, this is an invasion, an intrusion, rather. Yeah, okay, so it's because of that incident. I'm getting the impression that they've just been waiting for this opportunity to begin with. It's admirable, but I feel like it's not going to fly. It was such a great touch in the first episode, having their whole village, their whole thing, be about escaping rule. This is just another form of that. Doesn't sound like a request. Even his eyes are blonde. Yeah, but he doesn't regret leaving at all. Man, Thor just has one tough decision after another, landing on his shoulders. I feel like it's not a definite no, he would do it if it felt like it would save his family. If that's what's at stake. He would probably sacrifice his own life and his own comfort, his own values, for a bigger value. Yeah, yeah, this is a threat. And he knows that's the best tactic to take. See, yeah, this perspective is just all, it's just so innocent, naive. That would also defeat the purpose of what I think he's going to decide. <laughs> this guy's definitely killed people. And I feel like for Thor's, even if you fight and win somehow against this trained army in this village of nothings, that's not going to be the end of it. They're just going to come again with more people. And Leif held his ground too, didn't flee. He was on his way out. But he stuck around. That's really strong. Imagine being a unit so strong that you don't need to pay taxes. See, Leaf knows too. Just when I thought I was out, drag me back in. That is such a good shot and so telling. It just says it all. Thor's and Leaf Erickson. Two men against the world. Yeah, he was. I'm guessing it was what we saw, the opening scene of the show. Something about being choked underwater when I couldn't breathe anyway, just realized how much spite was involved. I mean, this is going to sound really, really bizarre. He's got to be absolutely crushed. But something about that last line makes me think that there's some tiny part of him that's relieved, you know, because I think he has a lot of guilt about it. He's been carrying this weight on his shoulders and living with the guilt of what he's done. You know, he probably remembers very acutely all the, the people he's killed or many of the people he's killed, yet is surrounded by great things. You know, he has a family that he values very much that adore him. He lives a, a peaceful life where he could do pot arts and crafts. He's got his mead. I know that weighs on you. If, if there are things you haven't answered for and you look around and you're just doing great, it shakes up the things you want to believe about life, which is that there's a, there's a balance and that things are fair. People get what they deserve. His main reason is to save his family and protect his village. And that's honorable. But it seems to me like there's a part of him that feels like he deserves it. Maybe even deserves to die. You know, it also feels weirdly terrible in ways you wouldn't expect. Being praised for things you don't think are good or being praised for doing nothing, you know, being told that you're amazing or whatever. You would think that praise and reward is good and criticism and punishment is bad, but I think that the true measure of how effective they are or how good they feel or how right they feel is what they're connected to. You know, praise or reward for nothing actually doesn't feel great. It's confusing. And similarly, punishment or criticism for nothing is harmful, but punishment and criticism for things you feel you've done wrong actually is constructive because it gives you a structure and model of life to rely on and you know everyone needs that on some level you know because we're all gonna fill in our beliefs about the world in one way or the other and if it's not actually connected to reality and some kind of more objective structure it's just internal chaos this guy's gonna be the first to go he's gonna be the first to go this you know what this reminds me of it reminds me of the first mission in attack on titan they're also gung-ho and then they had normal titan showed up and ate thomas this is the thomas of vinland saga and thorfinn took something out of this whole thing though yeah, take a lesson from your friend who's going to Valhalla. Oof. He's gone out of his out of his mind. It all went to his head. And also he's probably upset and worried. I'm a little bit busy. Everybody wants a piece of me. <laughs> and he's the town doctor? 
While we're making comparisons, he's also the, the Tanjiro of his village, doing everything, tying people's shoes for them, etc. Doris, can you do my laundry? I think it's time for a father-son moment. Doris must be so lonely in this world. <laughs> he's got to listen to warrior talk all day. It would be like living in Johto or Hoenn in the Pokemon world and having no interest in Pokemon. There's just no escape. Like everything is Pokemon everything everywhere. You just have to eat it all day. <laughs> You're all gonna die. You're all gonna die, like immediately. Your only chance is Thor saving you. <laughs> so sad. Ah, I just feel it coming. Man. The perspective is just so great. It's all he wants more than anything, but he just has no idea. Ah, it's all gonna happen so so prematurely. His father is probably waiting to train him, but it's all starting. There's no time. He's such a kid. Such a little boy. Oh no, that's the worst thing. Oh yeah, this chest. <laughs> Key item. That's your destiny, being unsheathed in front of your very eyes. Father's dagger. This is the best possible time for this. Great timing, Thors. Do you even know who the enemy is? <laughs> I have to sort of a jerk. Calling him out. A little bit of hypocrisy there. That didn't go the way I wanted it to. Better not be their last interaction. It better not be their last interaction. It's too early. And I don't think he's going to come back as a Mufasa cloud, unfortunately. I mean, for me, his death is a foregone conclusion at this point. I'm just sitting here in anticipation knowing that it's coming. This came up in comments on Patreon, and this is even more apparent to me now watching this episode. Thor's is a beautiful human being, but like Vander, actually, in Arcane, there's a little bit of a, a denial happening where it's too far into the realm of trying to avoid it at all costs. There's a certain amount of it that's in inevitable and is coming and is, and is real. Just from what I've seen so far, speaking of Pokemon, I feel like that would apply here as well, too. If you lock eyes with a trainer, you have to battle. You just cross someone's line of vision and, and a fight breaks out. I actually would not have any problem if he refused to kill at all. And I think there are some great protagonists that do that and make a very compelling case for that. But they they bear the full responsibility of that in those cases, typically. And they themselves also follow that code. This doesn't feel like just pure, strong, solid principle. That's in there as well. But there also feels like an element of guilt and avoidance. Ask glad. What gave it away? Are these assassins? They're not talking about Thor's, are they? Why? What is he a double agent for the for the English? I knew Flocky with Flocky was an oaf. What was Thor saying about not having enemies? But what is his game? Is he actually working for the English? Is he a double agent? Is he threatened by Thor's because of how great he is and he wants to take all the glory? What exactly would he gain from killing Thor's? His former comrade in arms.